So I'll I'll pass the mic now on to uh, Professor Lacal. Um, I think uh, again, incredibly lucky to have him with us as well today. Uh, again, won't do justice to his resume as well, but he's also a very well-known economist, and he's also actually been in the hot seat with <laughs> in from the investment management side with Citadel and Pimco. Um, so. Professor, welcome to the forum, and again, appreciate you taking the time. Um, and would love to love to hear your thoughts about how you see the the world panning out in front of us of the next few quarters, and uh, and how best we can we can stay abreast and and try to predict what will happen. Thank you, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure, and I I love to be opening for Professor Hanke because I I should be opening for and having this. Uh, absolutely incredible uh, lecture that we've just uh, had, which is, which is exactly the problem. And I think that I'm going to build upon that if, if Professor Hanke allows me, because um, I'm, I'm going to try to make uh, our guests understand the challenge for the economy of quantitative tightening. Um, in, uh, we, when we analyze money, money growth, and the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, we have a pretty good idea of how the monetary mechanism uh, builds through the commercial banking and the financial world, and how much uh, monetary expansion generates in terms of multiple expansion in equities, uh, yield compression in bonds, and certainly the increased valuation of private equity venture capital. So we have uh, basically a, a rough estimate that each unit of uh, currency that is added to uh, the balance sheet of the central bank adds approximately two to three units in the financial world. Huh? So it basically generates a multiple expansion uh, well above earnings, uh, macroeconomic growth, uh, solvency and liquidity ratios, whatever the, the valuation measures you want to consider. The problem that we have is because we've had almost two decades of very aggressive expansionary policy, quantitative easing, even in periods of growth, is that uh, we're in uncharted territory in terms of what is going to be the impact of tightening in valuations. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the average investor, it's very, very difficult to gauge what is likely to be the acceptable price to earnings ratio, price to book value or yield, or in a, in a, in a period in which we might uh, see to start with a very weak period of growth with high inflation as contraction in money supply builds into the credit mechanism, but also into the uh, destruction of capital that the uh, reduction in prices in capital markets entails. That is also going to have a significant impact on investment and, and on how banks are able to provide credit to the real economy. So, so I would start by uh, saying the following. Uh, the, the, what we are thinking is that the tightening cycle that we are seeing, which would equate to about $3 trillion of balance sheet of central banks between the major central banks, would basically lead to about uh, nine to 10 trillion of loss of market value of the of quoted assets. Um, that in itself generates a big banking problem, which is what we are seeing right now. What we are seeing in with Silicon Valley Bank and with Credit Suisse is not a cause, is a symptom. The symptom is that the asset base is way overpriced and way overvalued. And the profitable part of the asset base generates no real return 
And at the same time, the liability side of the banking uh, system is seeing a weakening of the capital structure because of the loss of uh, the in price of the equity, but also from the loss of deposits. No? So that race mm, is a very challenging one, is a very challenging one that is inevitably going to lead to a very severe credit crunch. Um, if we add to what Professor Hanke was mentioning just a few minutes ago, the, the impact for the real economy is going to be abrupt and is going to be very severe and unfortunately is going to be widespread, i.e. the impact in credit is going to start not by affecting the zombie firms that have risen massively throughout these years, percentage of zombie firms in, in the stocks 600 rose to all-time highs in 2019 is not going to do that. It's likely to happen starting with small and medium enterprises very dramatically. No? Mm -hmm. So um, for businesses right now, the way to prepare is certainly to hold on to cash as if there's no tomorrow. Because the level of uh, the, the severity and the rapidness of the credit crunch in an environment in which the tightening of monetary policy happens so fast because at the same time you have the destruction of capital coming from the, uh, the valuation of the asset base of most banks, that is, uh, that is not going to be uh, uh, what, the, what the Federal Reserve calls a uh, soft landing. There is no such thing as a soft landing. You, you, either, you either have a, a, a significant recession or you continue to inflate the economy uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with aggressive uh, expansion. Um, I think that the other difference for the global economy in this uh, environment is that when you look at aggregate demand of money globally, you think that you see a very different aspect of what we saw in previous crises is that for the first time in, a, in an inflationary period, we have most developed economies, governments, not just not taking any action to reduce their deficits, but increasing their deficits. So the, 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 the policy response from the fiscal side is exactly the opposite of the policy response on the monetary side, which makes it that the reduction in aggregate demand that is likely to come from the reduction in money supply will come only from the private sector. And that obviously is much more negative for the productivity of the economy, employment, etc., than if it was a widespread reduction in money demand from the private and the public sector. I think that the other problem in this in this current environment is that, um, on the one hand, central banks central banks are basically uh, trying to solve an impossible equation. One is to, i.e., combat inflation by increasing rates, and I come back completely agree to the points that Professor Hanke made. Um, and the other hand is uh, an increase in the balance sheet coming from uh, massively uh, injecting liquidity to give loans to banks so that they don't uh, go bust, mm -hmm. which is what has happened with the Federal Reserve. And it's also happening with the European Central Bank, but the information will be prepared, will be published much later. They, they publish uh, information in a much less uh, uh, rapid way than, than the Federal Reserve. So um, the problem with that is that that means that the bank, that, the, that there is tightening and at the same time, just regurgitation of capital that goes to maintain, to zombify the deposits, but that doesn't lead to credit growth. It doesn't lead to productivity and it doesn't lead to higher investment. It's also to me, extremely concerning that the narrative has been made that the problem has been caused because Silicon Valley Bank invested in technology. 
And therefore, because they invested in technology, which is very volatile and very risky, the, the problem was that Silicon Valley, the problem is investing in technology itself, which is atrocious. And, the, and it's already impacting startups and uh, investment in innovation that is going to plummet to levels that we have not seen in many, many years. And that is a big concern to me because that means lower productivity growth, certainly lower real wages and a, uh, and a stagnation of the economy. So um, the choice right now is between a deep recession and a Japanese zombification. The European Union has already made that choice a few years ago. It's called Japan all the way no? And the, and the question is what is going to happen in the United States, which is a much more robust, certainly more dynamic and much more uh, uh, innovative economy. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the, the, as, as Professor Hanker was mentioning before, lagging indicators are extremely strong in the United States. They were also extremely strong prior to uh, the 2008 crisis and prior to the burst of the dot-com bubble. Um, but the leading indicators are not good. And consumer confidence, uh, the uh, uh, manufacturing services, PMIs, especially new orders, et cetera, are already showing that, that impact. So for businesses, I think, the, if, I, if I have to recap a little bit, is that what I would suggest is first is to definitely prepare yourselves for a deep downturn. Hmm? Why? Because if I'm wrong, hmm, which I hope, then you'll be better off. And if I'm not wrong, you'll be better off as well. The second one is to hold on to cash and to remember that the vast majority of uh, uh, of mildly successful small and medium enterprises that collapse. Do, do, it, do it due to working capital requirements. Um, the other uh, recommendation that I would give certainly is that uh, is not to think that the fact that inflation is going to come down quickly, which is true, is going to mean that long-term interest rates are going to fall rapidly, i.e. don't enter into the working capital debt trap of saying, oh, this is going to mean much cheaper and much more widely available debt. The cleanup of, because what has happened in the banking system is that it has concentrated all the mistakes of monetary policy and fiscal policy in balance sheets that on top of it, in order to generate a little bit of return above cost of capital, they have leveraged themselves much more drastically. So, it's, so the, the, the credit mechanism is not going to improve as fast as uh, you will see, for example, uh, a pivot from the Federal Reserve or a pivot from the European Central Bank, which may be a given, but for all the wrong reasons. It's not a pivot because the economy has won the inflation battle, but because inflation is collapsing due to a crisis, no? ultimately aggregate demand is, is what is going to drive inflation lower. And that's coming from a, from a deep recession in the, in, the, in, the, in the real economy. I also have one final element, which is emerging economies. No? Emerging economies have uh, entered into the devil's alternative, which is to have twin deficits fiscal and trade deficits in periods of growth and in periods of recession and a much higher dependency therefore on hard currency be it the dollar be it the euro particularly the dollar to be fairly honest so global demand for dollars is likely to rise dramatically in and that is likely to cause a second effect on uh, the most uh, the weakest of the emerging emerging economies I think that it's very obvious, and I, I, I'm intrigued if, if Professor Henke agrees with this. It's very obvious that Latin America is in very, very difficult shape, and uh, that Asia is in a much better shape. But uh, in general, I think that the problems that we that are that are uh, coming to the fore uh, from developed economies are likely to lead 
to an emerging economy uh, slump driven by currency uh, lack of lack of access to hard currency. Uh, that is that is in a nutshell the 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 way that I see it. Uh, from an from an investment perspective, the problem the the problem shown in central banks and in banks is a very dangerous one. Is the is the one that shows that the least volatile and safest asset is as volatile and as risky as the most risky assets. When you see sovereign bonds collapsing 20%, that means the equivalent of 90% for an unprofitable technology stock. So the fall of 2022 of sovereign bonds is as negative, if not more, than uh, the one of what is in, in, in perceived by anyone as riskier as activities. And I would pay a lot of attention to private equity because the write downs that are likely to come from this environment are going to be phenomenal. I've run a little bit out of time. Uh, excuse me if that was the case. Um, no, that's that was spot on, Professor Lacal. So, uh, folks, um, any questions for Professor Lacal or Professor Hank uh, before we go to breakouts? Let me just make one comment. Um, Daniel's excellent presentation. I, I fully agree with everything that he said. It, as you can see, it, it weaves in with, of course, more granularity than, than my presentation, but it fits perfectly with what we're, we're both saying essentially the same thing. I would like to make one, one little remark just to show you how closely these things tie in. Early on, Daniel was talking about capital destruction. And when I talked about the transmission mechanism for monetary policy and the quantity theory of money, I said after sustained changes in the money supply, that with a lag of one to nine months, you get changes in asset prices. Well, that's exactly what he's talking about. He labeled it asset destruction. <laughs> And, and balance, tearing up balance sheets was right on. The only other little remark I would make is that, uh, as Danielle said, the idea that Silicon Valley Bank was loaning to the tech sector and this narrative going around, the tech sector is gonna be hurt because of all, all the dependence on Silicon Valley Bank uh, in that sector. It turns out, this is my 95% rule, 95% of what you read in the press is either wrong or irrelevant. <laughs> the Silicon Valley Bank wasn't making that many loans. They, they were buying government assets. This That's idea that, that they were the engine financing all of this Silicon Valley tech, they, they, they had a very small loan book actually. They, they were, what did they do with all those deposits that got piled in there? They bought government securities. They, they didn't make loans. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. But anyway, Daniel, that, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Same likewise. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Lacal, Professor Hanks.